Welcome back. Wow, I've just been amazed. I've been amazed by the conversations I've kind of been hearing and a part of. And I've snuck into a few sessions here and there. It's just been an amazing couple days. It always is uh, both energizing and educational to come to uh, the summit. And as you're going to hear about in a few minutes as we wrap up after David, our, our planning actually, we get the night off tonight. We've decided we're going to take the night off, but then tomorrow morning we start up again for next year. We're going to hear, tell you more about that in a few minutes. So uh, I don't really have a formalized introduction for David. Um, we've not ever done really a formalized introduction. I, um, so, but historically, we've always had David kind of close out as do a fireside chat, a very informal uh, sort of reflections on what he's been thinking as he's gone through the last year um, and as he's gone through the last few days, kind of what's kind of come to his mind. And, you know, although we've grown, it's something we've tried to keep. Um, and he's been open to doing that again today. So... Without further ado, we have David Rose. Fire side chat. Okay. Oh, fabulous. Okay. Um, well, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, this is... Uh, feels like the home conference for me, for sure. And I always uh, come here to learn new things, and I certainly did that. I'm not going to be able to summarize everything I learned, obviously. And I'm already down to 17 minutes and 48 seconds. Uh, so um, I want to be incredibly spotty and then make a few general comments. Um, but it's clear to me that the field is growing and it's not just the numbers. It's great to have it doubled in, uh, since last time. Um, and it's great to hear things like Skip told about Ed Leadership has a whole bunch of articles that um, focus on UDL and all of those. There's plenty of signs of, uh, of a movement that's growing and it's terrific to see that. Um, and I want to argue that UDL, though isn't best measured by those numbers, there's more articles, there's more research, there's more people in the room, um, but by the extent to which it's a disruptive force in education. And I think there's examples of that for sure. Um, and I want to just uh, um, use that as a little bit of a frame. Um, and I'm going to concentrate I think on the issue that kept coming up in a bunch of sessions, which is the issue of what are we measuring? What are the measures of our success? And I want to um, concentrate more there than on the great things I saw. I was just at the P.K. Young session. I hope some of them are here. Are they here? You know, it was you just see fabulous teachers doing really wonderful things, and you just want to talk about that. But you'll have to go there and see them, and uh, there were other sessions. Uh, here where you just get inspired and a lot of that is something I can't capture here. Um, I want to highlight a couple things from the first day and then I'll run out of time to do that but I thought Tony got us uh, off to a great start um, and nailed a key idea about that to some extent we're a disruptive force on culture itself and people often think of UDL as challenging methods or challenging assessment and stuff like that. But I think Tony was really good about nailing that it's actually cultural change that we're about. And I know at CAST, people have been, uh, who've been out in doing implementations have come back and said, you know, it's not the guidelines or the checkpoints that are the critical things, it's changing culture. And so uh, it was wonderful that you all thought of having Tony begin there um, uh, because I think that's where we need to get. And I thought she gave me a great relieving thing when she talked about that I didn't have to be an expert on every culture of the kids in my classroom. I had to be an expert on mine. What was the lens through which I was seeing them and seeing my practice? And that was very relieving to me to begin the conference with because I've always been troubled by how could I really successfully know all my kids? But I think her 
twisting of that to say what I need to be clear on is what my cultural values have been and how they influence my teaching and how they might be barriers to my students and so on. It was, uh, I thought, really good. So I like it to think that we're in the business of a disruptive change on the culture of schooling rather than specific practices. Um, but just to highlight where we're going, how do you measure cultural change? Um, it's a lot different to measure cultural change than whether the person has uh, uh, done enough video in their classroom. Okay. Um, I particularly like the framing that uh, Dave Davis did as well. Um, because I think it overlaps with culture. The um, thinking about it as an experience. It's perfect to be here in Disney World, and uh, that I think he captured exactly what's right. That Disney knew he was creating experiences, and uh, they're whole, and they involve all of the three things we talk about in UDL. But what Dave was saying was, I thought, really powerful. That what we want to do is create experiences that aren't just good now, but that change the kids' views of what the future is and change them to be different kind of learners for their lifetimes. And I just want to highlight where we're going to, that measuring that is very different than measuring do they know their math facts. But how are we going to measure that, in fact, we've changed their lives, that, in fact, the experiences we gave them in schools are ones they want to replicate again and again and again in their lives? And I thought. Uh, Dave really hit that on the head for sure. Um, I uh, also was quite jazzed. I think Don McMahon's still here. Is he still here somewhere? He's a, uh, where are you, Don? Okay. So Don is far out on the fringe. Uh, I'm joking about that a little bit. But he talked about uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, and it was really an impressive uh, presentation. Um, and uh, it gave a glimpse of the future to which we're actually heading. Very, excuse me, very, very powerful tools that certainly can transform the way we teach, but they're clearly going to transform the culture into which kids are going to grow. And that we actually, they are, in fact, disruptive forces. Uh, that you can learn things that we can't teach in classrooms now. Um, and uh, specifically learning how to do things, being active in your learning, but active in extraordinary circumstances that we can't uh, traditionally do in classrooms. Uh, and our students are out front of us, so that's a challenge to me. I'm not a gamer, to be honest, and so I'm hoping that Don can kind of come meet with us and help us get into the world that our students are really going to live in. Um, so those tools are going to change culture, too. And they are already for our students. They're living in a different culture than we grew up in. So in those kinds of things and many others that were here, um, the cultural change, I think, that is most important is that because of these tools, and, and I left one thing off of um, Tony's talk, that it's actually not just tools that are changing our culture, but the mix of our cultures bringing new cultures into our classrooms is a chance, an opportunity for us to be better learners, us as teachers. And uh, those two are part of the cultural change that we need to make. So um, our goals need to change. And you all know that at UDL we talk about expert learners. Why? Because there are going to be new tools developed all the time. Whatever Don showed is going to be old hat in five years. And the cultures that we're mixing with are broader, more extensive than we ever had before. So our culture is going to continue to change, and as people have said, faster and faster. So that's why we need expert learners. We need kids who are really good learners. It doesn't, it's pointless to teach them what we know now and the skills we know now as the primary goal. What we need is to prepare them for the rapidity with which change is going to happen. Um, and I like it. I think that that's uh, still true, that expert learning is a clear goal. And I also want to emphasize that expert learners have those three things. They are knowledgeable. They have great strategies for learning. But most importantly, they're incredibly highly motivated to keep learning. And that's where Dave Davis was hitting, that the end result of our schooling is should be kids that want to learn even more than they did when they came into our schools. 
Uh, and a lot of the things we do in schools, unfortunately, in traditional schools, not people in this room maybe, are making kids so that they want to learn less and less, um, at least of the kinds of things that we're teaching. Now I want to get to the heart of what I wanted to make remarks about, though. And, and Eric, is Eric Moore still here? People have real lives, I know. Yeah, OK, well, then I can speak freely. <laughs> um, so uh, Eric's talk was the one that um, talked about what is evidence and what is research and how do we get to the ki answer the kind of questions that came up in almost every session. How do we measure success in ways that would convince other people, would convince ourselves, and would convince our students? I don't think it's an easy thing, um, partly for the reasons I've just said. If culture change and expert learning is your goal, then measurement is really challenged. So I want to argue that one of the things that is true of UDL is it's a very disruptive force on how we measure student success, but on how we do evidence gathering. How do we do research? And I think you all are aware that there's a lot of tension in the field of measurement. Uh, as people are realizing that the kinds of things that are easy to measure are not the most important things. And that people who make tests and all of that are finding uh, a new climate um, where the kinds of assessments that we're doing now can't possibly sustain themselves. And so I want to make a couple remarks about that. One is the assessments we use, particularly standardized assessments, really are assuming that what we want are kids that are more or less the same, except good or bad, on some particular thing. Um, that we're trying to, in fact, get everybody to be more the same. And that way we can standardize the test and standardize the ways we teach and all of that. Um, but in fact, UDL is much more disruptive about those kinds of things. Because it says, you know what? And this is, I'm not sure we've ever talked about this. I'm not sure I have. But if I were to say, what would you want to measure at the end of schooling? It's not that have kids all got to the same place, but are the kids more diverse at the end of their 12 years in K-12 than they began? That our job in the UDL world is to, in fact, discover what are the ways in which kids could really be different so that they have interesting, valuable careers that aren't all the same. Some of you may have seen a little video I made about we need schools that are like orchestras, not that are like solo musicians. And what we want is not everybody feeling I need to be a clarinetist, but that in fact diversifying the amount of the kinds of instruments you can play is what schooling needs to be about. Um, we want to broaden the horizon, not narrow it. So we can't do the standardized tests are just the wrong kind of thing. Um, they cause us to want to standardize our teaching, but they mostly narrow the goals far too much. So anyway. One thing I want to say for clear is we need measures that say, have you as a teacher diversified your students? Do they look like there's more ways to succeed at the end? Have they found their particular identities? Have they found their particular strengths? And yes, are they able to manage their particular weaknesses? So uh, finding measurement devices that do that is what um, I think we'll need to go. Um, the new science of teaching, I think, similarly will change because of that, that we don't need science of engineering. How do we proceduralize education? But teachers need to do the science of discovery. What is special about this child? What is the path that this child can most take to be successful? Um, that discovery has been, uh, what should I say, uh, depressed too much, that we're proceduralizing, looking for what is the things you, that we can all do as teachers that are all the same. That's a crazy notion. Um, so in some of our groups, it's come up fidelity. And that, like standardized assessment, is really under attack now. And UDL is very much a part of the disruptive force about it. What does fidelity mean in a UDL classroom? Because all of you know, wow. I'm really not looking to have all of the teachers do the same thing. That doesn't feel like UDL at all. 
Um, you don't want all the school districts to be doing exactly the same. So fidelity has to be a very different thing than, um, uh, than uh, proceduralizing. And uh, Eric's word was operationalizing. Operationalizing in a standard way, say, and I have to say this, people do this with UDL. Have they done checkpoint 3.2 and uh, 1.8? as if you could proceduralize it to that kind of, just do these things and you'll be doing UDL. But that's not what it's about. And I thought I'd give two examples. Um, uh, what would fidelity look like to a person who's teaching music or art? And what we want is not actually fidelity either in our students or our teachers. Um, I, I've done quite a bit of research on what makes uh, Judy Garland, Lady Gaga, Adele famous. And it is not that they are operationalizing music. It's not that they hit the notes perfectly. It's not that they hold a quarter note one quarter. It's not that they sing faster than anybody else. And you realize, oh my god, a lot of people would want to proceduralize their singing into can they read music? But that's not what they do. That's not what makes them great. Um, and jazz, uh, which I know very little about, is a great example. The minute you would try to say, here's what jazz is, and it's holding notes this long, playing this fast, da 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 da, you realize, wow, we'd have evaporated exactly what jazz is. So I want to argue that UDL is saying we need to be more like jazz. We need to be more like artists. That is, we're creating new kinds of individuals who are creative and original and in their own way expert learners, but not all in the same way. Um, and uh, I have to, I'm going to just ship them, and I've got two minutes and I can do it. Um, no, that's all right. I want to show you. Uh, a great example of the problem of trying to measure one level down below what makes Adele great, okay? And I'll use Picasso because I don't know Adele's music very well. Um, so uh, think of you're trying to be uh, someone who's measuring, is Picasso a good painter, all right? And um, I'm going to show you Picasso's development. I think I can do it in a couple minutes. So I'm going to show you Picasso painting at age 12, OK? And you can sort of, well, first of all, I hope you're going, oh my god. This is, you, this is a sixth grader <laughs> um, who is doing a uh, painting here it's, um, uh, from a cast. And you sort of could see that you could measure that, you know? But it's not, are his lines straight? Are they smooth? It's none of those sub-skills. It's that, wow, he's captured this in some way that's extraordinary. And here's Picasso at 14 years of age. Look at that. He's seen some Baroque painting, and he goes, wow, I don't have to be so quite so literal. I want to create affect. And a few more paintings. You start to see he starts to place, realizing, well, I don't have to be literal. I'm not following an operational script here. I'm getting a voice of my own. So look how his voice changes. Um, here's 18 years old, OK? Then he comes across some Spanish, um, what do you call it, impressionist painters. And look how his painting changes. He says, whoa. He gets no, new knowledge. You can paint in different ways. You can have a different thing. What you want to go is for more emotion than just the object itself. And so he paints. And look at that. You see, wow, you can see him absorbing and learning from Impressionism. But then his teacher, this is the fabulous part that you're going to see. Teacher says, you know what? You should go to Paris, because there's a show of the Impressionists. And so he goes to Paris, and I'll do this faster because I'm near the end of time, but look what happens when he goes and sees the world of Impressionism in that great show. And you'll see, oh my god, he's aping. I'll go through it fast, but you'll see he's aping and perfectly aping 
Picasso, I'm sorry, um, uh, Renoir, uh, uh, Degas. Look at that. Can you see that? You go, that is Degas, okay? Um, Cezanne. He just, Renoir, he copies them and gets them under his skin and in his skill box. But this is not limiting him, and you can't measure Picasso by saying, can you do a Renoir? It's a step along the way. What you really want to do, and there's uh, the pointillist style. He copies them all. But what happens is he eventually, if I, uh, sorry, I'm a little over, I apologize, I'm almost done. Just to show you, because I think you can tell that a cast uh, in particular, and for lots of you, we're beginning to see the emotional side as the critical side of um, UDL. And you've probably heard of Picasso's blue period. All his paintings were blue for a couple years. You know why they were blue? Because his best friend died, Casagamas. And he only had a palette that was blue, because that's what he wanted to express. And everything was blue. But he finally recovered, just to show how important affect is for kids. Picasso looked narrow for a couple of years because he felt so blue. And not understanding that as a teacher and saying, you should be using more colors because that's what we're measuring. Can you use a lot of colors is not to understand what was happening to Picasso. But someone didn't do that to them and said, keep painting. And then I won't go to what Picasso did. And he exploded after this when his emotions came back. So the challenge for all of us is how do we measure the birth of Picassos? And how do we make it sure that our schools are going to make Picassos possible rather than that we do low-level things and measure whether they can do straight lines or circles? And that requires human teachers of the kind in this room. And that's why I leave this room feeling very good, because I see people that really care about the affect of all of our kids and turning them not to be uh, rigidly all the same, but Picassos and Matisse's and uh, give me some other names, uh, great paintings, that they're going to be very different. And some of them aren't going to be painters at all. At any rate, I'm just. Delighted I had some time with all of you and I'm very encouraged. Thank you for your time.